Welcome everyone to uh, our uh, 13th <laughs> annual uh, Bay Street Film Festival and our last Bay Street Film Festival. Uh, my name is Kelly Saxford. Um, next year we're going to be the Vox Popular Media Arts Festival. Um, so we'll be carrying on. But uh, this is our first uh, master class session. Um, and I'm really pleased that Ryan Boyko is here and, uh, and Alejandro Yoshizawa um, from Vancouver. From? Uh, I live in Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah. Okay, Hamilton. So, um, anyways, I'm, we're just going to get on with it because we've started a few minutes late. But um, so happy that you all made it out and uh, hope you can stick around for the next session because, anyway, <laughs> it's going to be dynamite. Good morning. Uh, we've decided to split it up. We've got well, about 45 minutes each. Uh, we were told if we go over, that's okay, but it's good because we had some technical difficulties this morning setting everything up in the first group to make sure, so it's good that we've got a little bit of, of time afterwards. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, the session is called Canada 150, Canada's Forgotten Past, and I think both Alejandro and I touch on parts of Canadian history that, uh, that are missing, either, either intentionally or unintentionally, depending on who you talk to, or your, um, whether you've learned about it in school or learned about it in university or, or just through friends and family. Uh, what I will talk a little bit about is um, my film, which is the closing night film, That Never Happened, Canada's First National Internment Operations. So between 1914 and 1920, over 8,500 people were wrongfully imprisoned in Canada, not for anything that they had done, but simply because of who they were and where they came from. Uh, those people were people who came to Canada. They were invited to Canada uh, because... Canada had what was then the Northwest Territories in the late 1800s. Clifford Sifton was the Minister of the Interior. And his job was to ensure that he was bringing a whole bunch of people to settle the prairies, what is now Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Otherwise, that was at risk of being annexed by the United States. And so his job was to ensure that they had people coming to Canada people that would farm the land, clear the land. It was a hostile environment, it was a rough place, it wasn't a place that many people wanted to be. Um, so what he did is he sent out flyers throughout Eastern Europe, uh, primarily Poland, uh, Ukraine, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Croatia, that area. Well, that area was also uh, annexed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So when Canada went to war with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, what happened was all of these people who had been invited to Canada were suddenly suspect. Um, they were suddenly people that we didn't want to talk to, they were people that we didn't know about, and we didn't know where their loyalties lied. Uh, the reality is these were friendly aliens. They, they were called enemy aliens, but they were friendly aliens. And there is records. There are records from uh, Great Britain. There are records from the United States. These were friendly aliens. They were invited. Um, and there were over 80,000 people that were made to register. Um, and the reason that they were made to register is Canada invoked something called the War Measures Act for the very first time. The War Measures Act was penned on August 22, 1914. And it's only two weeks after we went to war. So there was something else that was happening in the underbelly. And that something else was Canada had had a recession. So because Canada had this recession, uh, there were a lot of people that were out of work. And a lot of these men, women, who came from Eastern Europe, uh, primarily Ukrainians, uh, but there were other Eastern Europeans, some true ethnic Russians, uh, but the, the majority of the people that we're talking about were Ukrainians, or the majority of the people that we have records of were Ukrainians. Uh, so when they were coming to Canada, they had they had this idea, this Canadian dream. They were coming from a land that had been traditionally oppressed. It's still oppressed today, as you know, through the, through the news media. But they were offered uh, 250,000 acres of free land. That was, what the, that was what the advertisement said. 
So if you can imagine a family of three brothers who has a plot of land about the size of this room, well, when the parents die, they have to divide that three ways. So the, the possibility of having your own acres, uh, of having you know, 20 acres that you could go and you could settle and you could have for yourself, that you could in future divide was very appealing. So they started coming in the late 1890s. Many of them had become naturalized citizens. And then we had this issue with uh, the recession. And so when the recession started, you had a lot of people in the major cities, major cities being uh, at this time Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal. Those were the major cities in Canada that were affected. And you had a lot of people who weren't making it on the farms. They weren't successful uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they weren't farmers before they came here. They tried to make it, they were unsuccessful. They gave the land back to the government, ended up in the major cities. Well, with the recession, you had other guys who were from Canada or had been living in Canada for much longer who suddenly had no jobs. And then you had these immigrants who were coming into the major centers who also had no jobs. And everybody was fighting for the various different jobs that they could get in major centers. And what this caused was a lot of friction. Uh, it also caused welfare. We're, we're still seeing these same kinds of issues happening today. And uh, so people were anti-welfare, anti-immigrant, and um, then the war broke out. So you had all these single men who were working on the railroads, uh, they were working coal mining, they were doing all of the grunt work, all of the labor work that was needed and necessary to build Canada. But because they were doing all of that work, when the war broke out, they had no family ties. They were the first ones to go up and the first ones to go over. So all of a sudden you've got this railroad that's half built and you've got no labor force. So the theory, and it's just a theory because there is no proof, all of the records have been destroyed, is that these people who were the immigrants, they were intentionally discriminated against so that they could be rounded up and used as cheap labor. So that's what happened. That's why it only took two weeks for the War, War Measures Act to be in, invoked after it was penned. And there is, um, there is a, an account of uh, the fellow who ran the railroad, Sir Thomas Shaughnessy, who actually went to Borden's office three days after the war broke out. And they had a private conversation in a private room and who was the main benefactor of the internee labor, the railroad. So there, there are ways we can interpolate the data and say this was intentional and maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, so that's a little bit of the, the long history of how it started. Um, and internment took place from 1914 to 1920. So those of you who know your history will know that the war ended in 1918. So it continued for two years after the war because the labor force was so successful and these guys didn't know their rights. They didn't know that they had civil liberties. They didn't know that they had rights here in Canada. Um, many did. There, there are also accounts of there was a lawyer who was in the, in the camps and he was writing letters. Well, he got some of the worst treatment that we know of because the government didn't want to hear from him. So uh, there, there was all of these kinds of things that started happening. So now that you've got a bit of a, a broad history of the introduction to internment, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So uh, my name is Ryan Boyko, and I started as an actor. And I was working for the Stratford Festival of Canada, and the then artistic director, Richard Manette, came out to us. We were, uh, have, had these annual general meetings. And so he came out to us, we were in the festival theater, seats about 2,000 people, so, but we had a, but a group like this, maybe three times the size of what we've got here. And he stood on the stage and he said, look, I know that all of you here are not just actors. Many of you are writers, directors, playwrights, you're not just actors, you're not just anything. So 
what we are planning to do next season is we're opening up the studio theater to in-house projects, which means we are looking for uh, you guys to create one-man plays. We have two slots for next season for one-man play. So I left this meeting excited. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make this one-man play. It's gonna be great. Uh, and I'm gonna star in it. It's gonna be so awesome. What do I write about? I had no idea. Uh, I had no idea what I was gonna write about. I had no idea what it was gonna be. And so I started thinking. And I called up my dad. I was like, do you have any ideas, any thoughts? He's like, well, why don't you do something Ukrainian? I was like, I don't want to do anything Ukrainian. Like it's, you know, I, I grew up in a very Ukrainian household. We were, we were dragged around from location to location. And you, know, you have to learn Ukrainian dancing. You have to learn the Ukrainian language. And frankly, I didn't want any of it. So he's, his first thing is, well, why don't you do something Ukrainian? I was like, no, that's not interesting. Nobody wants to hear that. So then he said, well, you know, there, there's a lot of talk right now between um, officials in the Ukrainian community and the government about getting some type of a redress or an acknowledgement about the internment operations. And I was like, oh, really? Now, take you back to when I was in grade 10. My dad says, okay, I'm going to this Ukrainian event. I'm like, I don't really want to go to this Ukrainian event. And he says, well, the filmmaker's going to be there. He knew what I wanted to do. So... He knew what my currency was and said, hey, well, the filmmaker's going to be there. Why don't you come out? Don't think about it as a Ukrainian film. Think about it as, as something else. And this film basically went through the history that I've just given you about the internment operations. And all my life growing up, I had understood what a Ukrainian man was by being doctors, lawyers, pillars of the community, CEOs, uh, in fact, the premier of our province at the time was a Ukrainian man. So to, to experience racism towards my culture for the first time when I was in grade 10, it was shocking. It was an experience that something, it, it, it left an imprint. It left the, because I thought I was white, you know, we don't have any, any problems. There's no racism towards the culture. But to find out what had happened to their parents and grandparents in order for them to become these pillars of the community was shocking. And... I went to my grade 10 high school teacher, and I said, can you tell us a little bit about the Ukrainian internment during World War I? And he said, you mean the Japanese internment during World War II? And I said, no, I mean the Ukrainian internment during World War I. And he looked at me, stone-faced, and said it never happened. So here we are, 15, 20 years later, and I found that uh, we were going across the country to create a web series. And the web series is called The Camps. Uh, I'm going to show you guys one episode of The Camps now that you have a little bit of a, a foundation in what the internment was. Uh, but what I found when we were creating The Camps series is that everybody had been given the same information. Everyone who had asked questions, asked questions of officials, asked questions of government, asked questions about what had happened to their parents or grandparents, because their parents and grandparents are no longer here. And they didn't answer the questions when they were alive anyway. So everybody kept saying, that never happened. And so because I found that as a common theme while we were filming across the country, we did, we did an educational uh, web series that I've got cards for. It's completely up. It's available free on YouTube. You can go. You can watch it. Uh, you can share it, et cetera. While we were watching, or while we were creating it, so many people had the exact same uh, responses to some questions. I was told that it never happened, or there were no records, or nobody believed me, or uh, they thought that the people who were who were behind it, or the people who had the uh, had the research or had done the research, had falsified documents, had falsified research. So, so everywhere anybody was turning they were saying that people, people were sort of sneering at them. And I found that that was a common theme. And I, it was not something that we were doing for the camps. The camps was more educational. It was created for the YouTube generation. It's a quick uh, beginning, middle, end cinematic uh, story that can be told in under five minutes. That's, that's the intention behind the camp, so it can be taught in the classroom. Um, and then I'll show you an episode, and then I'll, I'll let you guys know a little bit 
about everything else. Can we get the lights? My name is Frank Gunkovich. I've been a professional researcher to the creation of forms of insurance in Canada during World War I. Uh, I tried to identify the potential corrosion prisoners of war here at Campus Casey. So the internees themselves were the biggest help to us uh, in placing the names on the big cairn. Um, they were the ones that led us to do the research uh, on finding out the original names of the internees that were buried here. We ended up putting their proper names up on top, date of death, and then the uh, original names in English underneath. And we were able to do that for all but, I think, six or seven of the internees in the cemetery. My name is Julie Latimer. I'm the curator of the Ron Morrell Memorial Museum here in Campus Spacing. And I first learned about internment when I became curator in 1990. Here we have our permanent exhibit on artwork and artifacts created by internees prisoner of war during the time of the internment camp, including this wonderful painting by Prisoner 2121, Paul Jocko, from 1917. We're seeing what an internee would see from, let's say, the steps of his barracks. We can see the double barbed wire fence in the back with a soldier here marching, and he has his, his, uh, his rifle with the bayonet at the end, and he's marching here. Here's a sentry box. It's important to preserve the artifacts, it's important to not get any dirt or oil or anything on the artifacts. This is a very important part of my job. The paint on any of the artifacts, the carving, they need to be preserved for many, many generations. I want them to stay as close to the original as possible, and so these will always be on. The interesting story about this cemetery is it shows the diversity of the internees that were buried here. Most of them are comprised of roughly 20, up to 20 different ethnic groups living within Austria-Hungary, the German Empire, Bulgaria, and the Turkish Empire. We have Bel Missouri, Ukrainian, Nikol Hemen, Polish, Dmitry Podialuk, also known as Harry Podialuk, Ukrainian, George Paluk, Ukrainian, Victoria Boka, he was from Romania, Jan Zagorny, Polish, Andrew Kuzik, Polish, Fred Kokopov or Fred Kokopchuk, Ukrainian, Charles Boro, there's actually Karlo Budo, Croatian, Alex Hassan, we had him listed as a Syrian, Mike Petron, also Ukrainian, George Smokat, Ukrainian, Mia Latvian, Croatian, Petro Shalalio, Ukrainian, Jan Luchak, George Uchuk, Ukrainian, Yurko Zungrin, Ukrainian, Ignaz Kalsina, Croatian, and Harry Shishul, who we have in a document as Ukrainian as well. So that's a German, and it's basically saying for their fallen comrades at Kappa's facing, and the Germans are on this side, and the Austrian something. Yeah, Austrian Hungarian passport, I imagine. Uh huh, yeah. As opposed to just, yeah. And one Turk as well. It's amazing that they actually put this up for their fellow prisoners. Yeah. The research is always ongoing, and we'll hope to eventually find the names of the other gentlemen as well. Thank you. So there are 33 episodes of those. I've got some cards here uh, that if you are interested, you can pick up on your way out. And all of the links are live uh, on YouTube now. So there is a date um, on right beside each, uh, each of the episodes. Those dates have come and gone, so they are all up now. So you can 
take a look. If there's a location that you're like, oh, I had no idea there was a, a camp there, you can take a look and, and watch several episodes of the camps. Again, there are 33. Um, it's designed with education in mind with the idea that, uh, I don't know how many of you remember when you were in school or elementary school, but people would uh, ask for everybody to do, do a different assignment and there would be, you know, 20 videos in the class and you were the one stuck with a partner and weren't able to, you, you did all the work, the partner got all the credit. Uh, so we designed it with the idea that there are 28 to 32 students on average in class so that with 33 each person should have their own episode in order to uh, do a self-presentation teaching to the students themselves and we are starting a pilot project in Toronto this year to basically build a, uh, not a curriculum but a, a, a tool for teachers to use a curriculum that is already in place. Uh, so going back to my story about the theater, I contacted all of the historians and all the people that you will see in the documentary that never happened. I contacted these people. Um, a lot of them were wary because they'd been, you know, pe people don't like to contact them for just random reasons. So uh, a lot of them held their cards really close, but gave me the research tools that I needed to go out and start working on this one man play. And I very quickly realized that it was way too big for a one-man play. There was no way I could do it, so it ended up on a shelf. In 2008, the government of Canada um, finally signed an accord uh, with the Ukrainian-Canadian community that created uh, a bill that basically said, we're going to acknowledge that this happened. There's not going to be an official apology, but there's going to be an acknowledgement. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a $10 million endowment fund. That endowment fund, which you see in the final credits of the camps, um, is called the Canadian First World War Internment Recognition Fund. And the Internment Recognition Fund is designed with a mandate that they have $10 million that has to stay in the accounts in perpetuity and they're going to work off the interest to create projects that get this information out to people. Uh, so I found out about this. Uh, again, my dad, it was Christmas time, my dad was like, how's that uh, internment play going? I was like, well, it's, it's not, it's sitting on a shelf. And he's like, well, they just created a fund, you should apply, why don't you turn it into a screenplay? I said, okay. So I applied. Um, I did all of the, the preliminary research of what the budget would be. Uh, I would have to go to Capus Casing, I would have to go to Spirit Lake, I would have to go to all these various camps that we have the most information about. Um, so those were the places that were gonna be my starting points. And it ended up costing the research trip something like $21,000. So I applied for the full amount and they gave me $4,000. <laughs> and, and so, at this point, I don't want to have egg on my face and say, well, I'm not doing it. So I raised the rest of the money, uh, both through, through friends, family, and credit card. I went up, I did all the research, and uh, we created the first draft of a screenplay for a feature film called Enemy Aliens. Uh, Enemy Aliens went on to see various different drafts, various different formations, and we are in the final stages of funding for this film, it's been seven years. Um, we have one and a half million guaranteed from the government of Ukraine. We are the first country or first company outside of the country of Ukraine to receive uh, government funding because they believe in the project so much. Uh, we are working very hard with the Canadian government to ensure that there is a Canada-Ukraine co-production treaty put in place. Uh, we've been working with them for about two and a half years and the head of the Ukrainian State Film Agency was just in Toronto for TIFF and we facilitated a meeting with him and Minister Jolie to try and get a co-production treaty signed. What they've said is they're looking at it. So there's still nothing official. So we are looking at other ways to raise the last two million US in order to put the, put the film together. While I was doing this, uh, I was approached by the internment fund and they said, we want to document all these camps before they go. So we're, we're just going to hire a videographer to go to all of the various camps across the country and, and just film what's left. And I said, are you asking me to do this? They said, yeah, we're asking you to do this. I said, I'm not 
willing to do it like that. I said, if we're going to do this, we've got to create something that's interesting, that people are going to watch, that's going to be cinematic, that's going to have a story. Uh, because otherwise, why are, why are we there? We're filming the ground. Big deal. It's, it's all B-roll. It's, it's useless. Um, so I gave them a budget of half a million. They said, no way. We, we're, we're not prepared to do that. Uh, can, you, can you whittle it down? And I said, the only way I can whittle it down is getting rid of a crew member. And so they're like, OK, what happens if you get rid of one crew member? Like, well, then that brings it down to just over 400,000. They're like, how do we get it to 375? I'm like, uh, we have to get rid of another crew member. That's the, that's the only, way I can, only way I can do it. And we pay the guys who are, who are running more. And we found that we couldn't fully get rid of that crew member because then that only leaves three. And we needed somebody else who was still going to be able to contact people. So we ended up splitting it up. So we, had, we went from five to four, basically to three. So we did three crew members. Uh, in Eastern Canada, we met in the middle. We had four of us for three different episodes, which was amazing, and then back to three for Western Canada. And that was the way that we were able to make the budget work. It was a lot of running, going, sleepless nights. Uh, but we were able to come up with something that, that I feel is very uh, important. It's important to Canadian history. It's important that it is now fully available, this being the Canada 150 uh, year. And as I said before, when I, when I finished this, I felt like there was a big piece missing with the story. And there are documentaries, there are pieces of literature, there are books on Canada's first national internment operations. They exist. So I didn't want to rehash something that already exists or repackage something. I wanted to tell a different story. And so the story of that never happened Canada's first national internment operations is really a love story to the people who fought to ensure that it came back into Canadian history, fought to ensure that it would be recognized by the government, and fought to ensure that this would never be lost to history again. Um, it is also a way to say, how is it relevant today? Why, why do we care? Um, there are a lot of things that happen in the world where people go, so what? It happened, big deal. Uh, I wanted to plant some seeds to create conversation, and that's the purpose of this film, is to plant some seeds, create some conversation, so that when people leave, they don't just go, yeah, it was good, or I didn't like it, or I liked it. But it plants some seeds for them to go, you know what? We, sh we should never have done this because of this. Or you know what? We absolutely should have done it because of this. So I tried to play both sides. I tried to show both sides. Um, we tried to acknowledge as many people as we have the research for, as many different communities. Um, because there were a lot of affected communities. There is an official byline on the internment website that you can go and see. And that tells you all of the known ethnicities that were affected. But we don't have the research. So what this hopefully will be is somebody's going to see it and go, well, I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure they said Croatian in there. I'm Croatian. I want to know what happened. Well, there's no research. Well, maybe I'm going to get a grant and, and see what I can do to find out what happened to, to my community. And that's really what this is about. It's about action. It's about bringing people forward. And I'm going to show you the trailer, and then I'm going to let Alejandro take over. We can get the lights. Nova Scotia. This large displacement of Ukrainian Canadians from 19 
1914 to 1920, affecting our community for decades. 106 of them in the internment camp operations did go missing and insane, and I think it would be a very difficult thing for anybody to be stuck in that situation and not have some play on, am I ever going to be free again? So imagine spending a 12-hour day in the forest cleaning brush now, in the summer, mosquitoes, in the winter, when your clothes get wet, and there you are coming back to a, a camp that's barely insulated. It's really something that this story is finally coming out, and it's still having a hard time coming out. It was so well hidden. How do you take people's hopes and dreams and the courage to come to a new country and then do that? There's a story of home away that is one that we need to remember. It has to be told and retold for the children of children of children. This is a story of rights. We need to tell that story so that other generations will be, in effect, responsible for carrying on the idea that unless we are prepared to defend those rights, we may very well suffer the same thing. So the film plays Sunday night. It's the final film of the festival. I hope to see you all there. Uh, thank you for listening. Hopefully you learned something. And we will have questions at the end. Um, so if you want to hold on to that, because I don't want to take up all the time and then have none left for him. OK, we'll ask quick. Is that OK? Yeah, OK. Not yet. Okay, perfect. That's a great question. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>